never. Uh, hello, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Crone uh, from the Department of French here in Trinity College and the Centre for uh, Literary and Cultural uh, Translation. Um, and I'm particularly honoured uh, to uh, be chairing uh, this uh, event uh, here uh, this evening uh, with two uh, astounding uh, poets with uh, a long standing interest in poetry, uh, language, uh, and translation and who could probably describe as well uh, particular forms uh, of oppression uh, that they have been uh, subjected to or witnessed uh, in the course uh, of their, uh, their, their lifetimes. Um, this particular topic um, is um, all the more appropriate in that the uh, two poets, uh, Elaine uh, Nicolanon and Carmen Gunn, uh, are poets who have uh, navigated uh, and traveled uh, between uh, different uh, languages and, uh, and cultures uh, and have explored in great detail uh, the experience of what it is uh, to live in uh, between and through uh, language uh, in uh, various uh, ways. Um, and as we look uh, all around us, um, I think uh, at the kind of political scene uh, these days, um, we see the way in which language can be spectacularly misused. Uh, and uh, uh, abused uh, and used for quite nefarious uh, purposes, um, it demonstrates perhaps even more than ever um, how vigilant and uh, careful we need to be uh, with the uh, words and uh, language uh, we use and how we think about uh, and care for, uh, for words. Um, so I just want to introduce very briefly um, our two uh, writers uh, this evening. Uh, to this event, which has been uh, organised uh, under the auspices of the Long Room Hub, 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 Hub. Long Room Hub, uh, and the uh, Centre for uh, Resistance uh, Studies. Uh, so, beginning um, with uh, our guest uh, Carmen Rubin, he is an award-winning uh, writer who is uh, currently based in uh, Long Island, New York, and she is an adjunct professor at Stony Brook uh, University, where she teaches uh, literature and creative writing. Um, she was born in uh, Romania and has lived firstly uh, in England, uh, Ireland and uh, France, uh, educated at the University uh, of Michigan and Balliol College in, in Oxford, uh, where she took a PhD in English uh, literature. Um, she is the author of uh, five uh, collections of poems, the most uh, recent one, uh, uh, Time uh, being, um, and uh, she is also the author uh, of the um, fascinating memoir, Burying the Typewriter of Childhood Under the Eye uh, of the Secret uh, Police. Um, she's also the author of um, a highly praised critical study, Seamus Heaney and East European Poetry and Translation uh, Poetics uh, of uh, Exile. Uh, and uh, more recently, her 2022 book, uh, poetry and the Language of Oppression was named an essential book for writers uh, by poets uh, and writers. Um, so we really are delighted to, uh, to have you here uh, this evening uh, come and take part in this uh, conversation. Eleni um, do I really need to introduce Eleni but I'm going to do it uh, anyway. Um, she is uh, one of Ireland's foremost uh, poets, uh, an emeritus professor from the School of English here, uh, in Trinity College Dublin and the Fellow uh, of the College. Uh, in 2016, she was appointed uh, Ireland Professor uh, of, of Poetry. And in 2022, uh, she was made C of a start of the highest uh, rank. Uh, and this honor was conferred upon her uh, by the President of Ireland, uh, Michael D. Higgins. Although I often think, uh, Elaine, about uh, Irish uh, 
proverb, we uh, will see the locht, uh, even Homer nods. Um, so of course, we'll be, we'll be watching for that uh, this evening. Um, an extremely rich body of poetry uh, that goes from uh, Acts and Monuments in 1972 uh, to uh, her collected poems, uh, which appeared in 2020. Um, she's also a distinguished uh, translator uh, of the, uh, among others, uh, other poets, the Lumi Homo, Michele Panchetti, and Ilana Manchoy. Um, so, uh, without uh, further ado, then, um, I would like to uh, invite uh, Elaine uh, and Carmen uh, to uh, begin sort of looking or exploring uh, the topic of uh, this evening's conversation. Thank you, Michael, for the kind words. Um, and it's wonderful to have Carmen Rugan here uh, to uh, talk about things which I think are very close to her as a writer, but also things which we need to uh, consider all the time when we're writing the ethics of our various practices, I think is the word that's on the go at the moment. Um, I met Carmen 25 years ago, actually, when she was studying in, of all places, Falcara, County Donegal, uh, with the renowned and redoubtable Irish poet Jimmy Simmons. And uh, we've stayed in touch over the years, and therefore I've been uh, watching and reading and thinking about her work. And one of the things that has struck me, and that I thought I would start by asking her, is that her relationship, uh, I suppose, first of all, with her language of, our, of origin, in which, of course, you did write at one time, um, with the process of moving to a different culture, a different language, but also the, uh, draw, the draw, the magnetism of the original language and culture. And I can see that in particular, actually, in some of your recent poems, uh, the use of uh, references to orthodox practices, uh, I mustn't use that word again, um, uh, liturgies, uh, but also attitudes. I was especially struck, actually, by a poem that you wrote uh, at, right at the beginning of the current terrible war in Ukraine about or the orthodox Easter, I thought uh, how, how uh, rich these systems are in uh, giving us something when we really need to say something, giving us a perspective, an attitude to it, we're looking at it. Uh, I suppose I want you to talk a bit about that. And if you'd like to read that poem or another, any, uh, another poem that refers to uh, the, the, the Romanian liturgies, uh, uh, please do. Okay, well, first of all, it's it's, uh, it's a huge honor for me to be here. I'm very grateful. And um, I'm incredibly moved by the fact that we are here 20 years later, as it were, something that I would have never imagined. Um, just, you know, coming here to look at the library for the first time and to, and to meet you. Uh, and uh, coming from Falkara, for, for that first visit, I had no idea that it was going to lead to a moment when we could be talking about where I come from in this way, uh, where we go back to the primary roots of my sensibility, I suppose, that I'm just now feeding into the poetic um, work that I'm doing. So I think it, starting with a poem from Ukraine, which I don't have with me actually uh, right at the moment. It, it struck me that, um, in a sense, the war in Ukraine was blessed by the Orthodox um, uh, community and the leadership in Russia. And I was thinking about the meaning of Easter, where it's all about forgetting, not forgetting, but forgiving. And the sort of preparation for it was a preparation for Clean Monday that I had um, that I had in mind when I wrote that poem about the start of the war in Ukraine, and I was thinking how we associate Easter in the in the Orthodox tradition 
in the village where I grew up at least, and then that sort of fed into the the, the whole cultural identity as, as a as a believer, I suppose. That idea that we are cleansing ourselves and the earth opens up. It's it's you know, it's thawing and it's getting ready for a new beginning. Um, and here we had the tanks roll over a land that is filled with snowdrops. The violence of that and people being so close to each other as relatives. And then we're talking about you know the, the history of the families across the borders as they've been redrawn over and over well, by, by history and by people. And I thought of that sense of violation of uh, this self that is trying to renew itself, in a sense. So this is where that orthodox, interestingly enough, the orthodox imagery has come back during the COVID pandemic in my work. I've been reaching to prayer in a way that I haven't been reaching in the past 20, well, we've been gone for 33 years from Romania. I had a pause from that, I had a break from that. And I think it had to do with getting a sense of newness in the English language where I have not had the religious roots, where I didn't have that sensibility. And so now as I'm growing older and I'm, I'm in my 50s and my father died in November, there is a sense of reconnection with all that symbolism. The, you know, when my, my, when my father died in November, I was asking, and I think I was needier than he was for those candles, for the candle in his hand to light the way. And I was doing this on, and that's technology in a sense, in translation, I was on FaceTime with him from New York, and my brother was on FaceTime with him from Latvia, from Riga. And I kept saying to my mother, please put the, light the candle, put it in his hand, and it was when he, you could tell that he could hear us. He was still there with us. And I was saying to him, I want to be with you every step of the way to the cross. And I think this is going to, but I was crossing into the past, mm -hmm. where I felt reconnected with the old self. And I think this is what you're catching up in here. That's so interesting. and. Of course, it, it, it enables me to go to say that uh, in your work, your father has always been a very important presence simply because of the, his extraordinary life, uh, because of the things that were done to him and to you because of him. Uh, and the, the, the wanting to be with him, but I think also perhaps, was it also wanting to understand how could somebody could uh, do the things that he did. Well, I will ask you to read a poem, which is very, uh, not very, the typewriter, it's the poem about burying the typewriter in the silent country, because that's the poem that tells about what your parents' uh, life was like. Um, so, well, when, when you're, whenever you're ready to read that poem, or would you like to talk a bit about it first? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, should, I, should I read it first and then talk about okay. it, or should I just uh, talk, talk about it first? I'll read the one first. I'll read the one first, yeah. So, um, yes, we'll, 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 go to, we'll go to this one. In the silent country, when the hens climbed the tree to sleep and the dog was let loose in the yard, when their children went to bed, she covered the windows in the doors with towels and hung the yellow blanket over the curtain rod. He went outside, around the farthest corner of the house, dug the typewriter from its hole, then from the garage brought a stack of papers hidden behind tools in a box. They locked the room. Both sat at the large oak table and put on gloves to hide fingerprints. Each night, one by one, hundreds of pages darkened with communal demands. Hot water, electricity, freedom of speech, freedom to worship, freedom to assemble. 
Their arms smelled of fresh ink. The room was the sound of struck keys between two breaths. Not one star looked inside, but the wind joined the hush of shuffled paper. Before the rooster broke the news of dawn, he put the typewriter in its white crate and buried it in the ground at the back of the house. She stacked the leaflets in boxes with beans on top, same beans for months, wrinkled and dry like old thumbs. With the towels back in the closet and the blanket down, the room returns to order, quiet and dark like the street. They kissed the children in their sleep. Posing as farmers, they left for distant towns where he filled mailboxes while she watched for informers and police. Hues of morning changed with seasons, but the early sun spilled the light over his face over her hands holding the map. At times, when they stopped to wash out the sleep with cold water, he could see the dark of her eyes. Fists met in a market and in the store, churches were demolished, and no one said a word. Those waiting in eternal lines, or those who saw the crosses kneel in the rubble of saints and chalices. When they slept, words rose from the stacks, and they breathed them as they were on paper. Hot water, electricity, freedom of speech, freedom to worship, freedom to assemble. They retraced in dreams each step. Typewriter in the ground, papers behind the tools, gloves in a cupboard, the dark entryways where the words went. Someone looking at them through a crack in the door. Each night, the words replaced them, her pale skin, her long brown hair. They whispered into the sleep of others in the silent country. It's strange, I haven't read this poem in many years now, and I can see that I wrote it in Donegal. So it was 1998, 1999 from a writing exercise. We were supposed to do a Zestina, and he never turned out to be a Zestina. <laughs> he never turned out. I was just looking for words that I had to repeat at the end of the lines and trying to understand how to do it. It never turned out to be that. But I think it was then that I was aware of the danger and the power and how words can replace people. Yes, and uh, also, of course, you're recreating an experience. If you were the, 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 the sleeping child, uh, then you didn't witness any of this. But you, you could, so you were recreating it from what you, from what you knew. Yeah. So that was those are stories that my parents were telling us after we came back, how they did and what they did. Because of course, my sister and I were spying on my father when we found the first placards and when we found the flyers <laughs> in the sacks, and so. Uh, we, and you know the beans. We found the beans in the buckets. But the poem is, and this is what we're trying to talk in the podcast today, and you know in the workshop yesterday, that the poetry is an act of imagination, is an act of creation that takes on the reality in its own language, in its own way. And I, and I was asking today, specifically when we were talking with Rosie, what does it do? What does poetry do that is different from other kinds of language? Mm -hmm. And so this is what, I suppose this is what I was trying to do, put people, the reader, or put myself rather, in the place where my parents were, imagining what it would have been like for them to mm -hmm. do what they were doing. And of course, uh, if you wrote that uh, 20 years ago, uh, you have returned to that scene and uh, to related scenes in an awful lot of your writing since then. Uh, is that partly just because uh, any writer has got their childhood and their youth 
as a, re a resource to revisit. Things look so different as the decades passed. Uh, or, or do you think it was simply because your experience was so extraordinary? It's both, I think. I mean, there is a sense that childhood is the, the foreign land where the, the country of the mind where we return. But I also, I returned to those specific times because of the archival research that I've done, which verified my memory, which verified, I was curious to find those flyers that I knew about from my parents. And so I went to Bucharest in 2010 and then in 2014 and I've asked for the secret police records and I found some of the flyers that he typed to the typewriter and the pictures of the mailboxes where he put them with my mother. And it was a sense of verifying my own existence, verifying their memories. It was a very sort of scholarly thing. I felt like I was in a Bodleian library, you know, I was there researching with a very um, strong purpose that I was going to get to the bottom of what happened then. And that in turn started another process. It was a, another loop that I started doing, which is the reflection, what does it mean to be free? What is the power of words? What is the power of language? Who else did that? Why is it important? Because uh, you know, finding the flyers that I was imagining that they were doing, and I knew the words because my father's, you know, told us, you know, this is what I was asking for: hot water, electricity, freedom of speech, and how somehow those words were fighting themselves for freedom for people, but at the same time, those were the words that put us all in, under house arrest mm -hmm. in the house. And then so there was I, a poet outside learning English in 1998 trying to imagine and recreate that experience to unburden myself and to tell the story of the family. Of course with the archives now and with writing about and interviewing my parents, um, it, it gains another significance of the record that exists outside my testimony and outside the moments that I try to create in poetry. Mm -hmm. You, you, the question that you raised there, what does it mean to be free, uh, is of course a, a, an extraordinarily large one. One of the things that uh, is, is evident in your writing is the crossing of borders. And in fact, I was struck, I don't think I had known that before, but in your last book, there's a reference to your father when he was young, before any of you were, of, of you were born, trying to cross the border uh, and being caught at the last minute. And I wonder, and you just mentioned that in relation to the uh, current situation in Ukraine, the fact that in that part of the world, borders have changed so often and for so many uh, very strange reasons. I mean, but when one thinks of where the borders of Romania have been and where they are now, uh, the, the naming of places, of course, uh, I have, heard uh, uh, a Romanian saying, you know, refusing to say Moldova, always saying Basarabia, um, because naming, the naming of places is so important. For, and then, uh, uh, finally, um, in burying the typewriter, at the very end of that book, there's a wonderful description of waking up in Rome, uh, which is a, a, the sense of freedom, which I think still all brings tears to my eyes, uh, partly because of, of knowing the place myself, but also because uh, the sheer ordinariness of uh, be being in a foreign city is so peculiar in the context of what you've been describing in the rest of the book. So say something about borders, I suppose. <laughs> no, 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 yes, I'll say something about borders. And, and, and I'm thinking about borders a lot, um, and of course, you know, uh, Roma Termini, Termini, the Italian word, Termini, Terminus, the end of the line, and then there we were at the end of the line, exhausted after two days on trains, um, going with, you know, each of us, our suitcase, and and arriving sort of at the, at the very end, <laughs> Terminal, you know, it's also said ter Terminal is, uh, you know, as terminal illness, as the, the, end, the end of everything, 
Um, so that moment was for me going back. And you know what was so interesting about that return to Rome was that I found my way back to the hotel as a blind person would find their way. It was, I couldn't remember the names of the streets. I remember only Pensione Dina, where we stayed with the other refugees going through the triage period, where we had to be checked for diseases and for everything else before we came to America. To, and then where they gave us cultural classes, mm -hmm. what do Americans expect when you ask them how they're doing, how do you write a checkbook, you know, that people do have checkbooks in America, we didn't. Um, and all, all of these strange things that are all really borders of different kinds. And, um, and I want to take that, if, if I actually, if, if I could read the poem about going with my father to the border of, of Bulgaria, because now my father, at the age of 26, escaped from Romania. And he, I wanted, and I told him, you know, before you die, you have to take me and I want to walk that part of the Iron Curtain, I want to feel it. And take me there. And so we did it. And so we walked. And it was files. I had <laughs> the maps from the secret police written in Bulgarian with a swamp where he stayed overnight, where in the haystack, in a, in a, in a hay pile with his friend. And, and I had his story, and I had this urge to, to see it. And then so um, I think it should be in this, um, it should be in this book. Um, a Walk with My Father on the Iron Curtain. I cannot tell you how exciting it was for me to take his arm and say to him, walk me, I want to go there with you. I wish he was here tonight. I walk with my father on the Iron Curtain. Arm in arm, my father and I return to the ground of his failed escape. It is now 48 years old. The border between Romania and Bulgaria at 110-111 point is bathed in gold October light. The maze silos where he slept are still here. An old border guard, curious to see us loitering on the train tracks, confirms Dad's memory as if history itself sent him our way with a flock of geese and the red tractor raising all the clamor in a peaceful morning. It's a holy day for me at my father's side with a map of his life, listening, listening to the tempest in that night, icy rain and snow, him and his friend inside the maze shelter melting snow for tea, the horrifying days when they searched the way with binoculars. He ran to the other side of the world with 17 half slices of salami, a flashlight, and a dictionary. Some point, probably more for good luck than for anything they could buy, a shaver for good looks and a heart full of hope. We carry on past Negruvoda, Torbukin railway station, golden afternoon, and the wind that buffets us, then Elhovo that looks more like a painting with a dream worked inside the peeling blue walls of the train station. My father, a puzzle in changing light, seen from broken windows. The coffee and baklava on the main street. Arm in arm in the old quarter searching for the hotel where he hid from police. The trap door that is no longer there. Memory leads us off the map then less so in fog, like an elusive fish. The map with the haystack where he slept to hide from border guards, his hike along the roads through the circular slam, 400 meters from Turkey. Ground of being on his ground of escape. You cannot take the dreams away from anyone who dreams. I never thought I'd be back here as a free man, he says. Here he is, the white in his hair, snow bells of temples, 
The gray green eyes, now wet, now dry, twinkling. Locals watch us step off ghost trains at the disused station. So now I might want to say, why are you so particular? How do you know there are 17 slices of salami? Well, I know. On March 20, 1965, there's a file of certification for transfer of objects. And here's a file that I found and I translated it in a book. Can I read you a little bit of yes. this? Because this is this I you know this is what makes a researcher into a poet, right? It, the undersigned, the lieutenant colonel, Kantarajiu Zehtin of military unit 02866, Constanza, handed in a major apostolion from the regional section Mai Dobroja received the following documents and objects. One certificate of area search comprising two files and an appendix of four photocopies. One tourist rucksack, one binocular case, two woolen blankets, one shaving razor, one shaving brush, one shaving paste, one battery 4.5 volts, one lighter, one coin of three lei, four coins of one lei, six coins of five ban, two coins of ten ban, one English Romanian dictionary, one German textbook, 12 pages long, in deteriorated state, three pieces of cotton for wrapping the feet, one beer bottle that contains 50 milliliters of medical alcohol, 17 half slices of hunter salami, two thin loaves of bread, and one screwdriver. And so, you know, it says, mm -hmm. you know, when they sent them at all of this, um, yeah, and, 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 and the report was concluded 2003-1965 in Constanza. So there is that sense of how many people have done that? Mm -hmm. How many stories do we know? How lucky am I to get this, to put it together? with my father and to make something out of it that tells that story. I suppose this is where my responsibility comes in. Uh, so that he is, in some ways, uh, very much an individual, in other ways, a representative figure, which is, again, these contradictions, I suppose, are what, what go to make poetry. Uh, in your last book, uh, Poetry in the Language and, uh, of Oppression, you talk about the problems of people writing about being victimized. Mm -hmm. that, it, that there's a claim that people can make, which is that being a victim makes you automatically, uh, uh, I suppose, a, a speaker. Is that true? No. No, and go, go on. <laughs> so, I mean, because there are limitations, mm -hmm. and, I suppose it depends on the attitude one takes to the idea of victimhood and being a victim, and it takes the attitude of what do you want to do with how you feel about how you've been treated of history. There's a question of people who, and we know this because history has offered many lessons. Now it's my turn to oppress you, now it's my turn to hurt you, now it's my, so, then I was I was saying today in a podcast that you know in a sense poetry is an offering to the reader. It's not meant to polemicize, so to to be a polemic. It's not meant to create um, more rancor where there is enough. And I think that's in that sense there is another responsibility to look at ourselves. At least from my from my experience, I cannot speak for other people here, but you know, to look at myself not as I'm a victim and I'm angry and I want to get back at somebody, but I am somebody who has the right to tell a story and to say it how it was. So can everybody be there are limitations. Most people I know from the Romanian community and from other communities, white eat and immigrants don't have the facility with language, they are not given the opportunity to learn the language. There are other people telling their stories instead of enabling them to tell their stories. So there are many complications, many reasons for, 
for why we would say that not everybody is a speaker. And it's not because people won't want to be, it's not because people are not capable themselves, but they're not really given the opportunity a lot of times. We do fall. I mean, I'm sure when I was in Ireland last time, the, the story that I heard about Romanians in Dublin was about people who burned their socks in a toaster because they were you know, they didn't know how to use a toaster and there were this sense of thieves and you know smelly armpits and, and all of this. I'm not to say anything about Ireland or about the but I'm saying that the the idea of being part of an exodus of immigrants is something to hold on to. Uh, if one is part of that community. Um, and so and at the same time we have <laughs> We have these examples where hundreds of people and their families were taken into homes of other people and given an education and given medical care and given an opportunity to, um, to explain themselves and to talk. Um, another complication of this is also, you know, when Trump was elected and I live in New York. You live in Michigan, your parents live in Michigan. That's Trump land. That's that's, you know, the, the only sort of brutes who vote for, for Trump, for Trump, you know, uh, you know, live there. And I was very emotional and I thought, but those were people who gave us a home. They gave us clothes, they gave us shampoo. They gave us, they taught me how to speak English enough to go to the University of Michigan. What makes you think that these are people who are anti-immigrants, who are anti-democratic ideas? So there is, I think, there's so many layers mm -hmm. of this. Yes, and thanks for that because it, 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 it opens it right out. Um, I suppose I'd like to I'd like to squeeze it back in again and say um, if it comes out as poetry or as refined critical writing, um, we're told, I mean, it's, it, it, this is a classic question for undergraduates, you know, poetry makes nothing happen. Uh, on the other hand, there is this compulsion, uh, or, or this, uh, yes, compulsion to record. Um, but is there something more than that in, in, if we're talking about resistance? So I've been talking and thinking about this for a very long time, and, and I think it's, it's, difficult, it's, um, it's difficult to formulate it now in a sense, what does poetry make happen? And we have to look at those intimate moments between the reader and the writer to find that answer. There is that quiet space when someone's feelings and someone's thoughts, the way they come out in language, if the language is beautiful enough and is interesting enough to invite the reader in, then there is a, well, I think Milos was the one who coined the expression, the transaction of meaning. There's a, there's a transaction there between the reader and the writer. And I would leave it at that in terms of what resistance is, is that ability to speak heart to heart with one another about difficult things. And I think with poetry you can do it because if you take a little moment, you could, let the, you could take a little instance and leave it at that and that would unpack it the way it does in the mind of the reader. There's got to be a certain mm. humility as a writer, I believe, in order to have that resistance. So you, you, you're depending on the reader. Well, I'm glad I asked you that because I think that that's a very fine definition of what, what one might hope to achieve. Uh, would you like to read another poem? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I was, you, you talked about reading at one point, you suggested you might read the, the divorce, but you don't have to read that one. Um, I, I think I want to, to leave it on, a, on, a, on borders and gratitude, if that's okay, because I have a poem that I've written very recently, and it's not in any of the books. It's called Archer Street. It's about walking the street next to my house, and I could, um, and it's meeting somebody who got lost. And it's about memory loss and who, who we think we are. Um, Archer Street. Today I met an old man who was lost. 
He stood between Yorkshire and Archer. I don't know where I am, he said. I don't know how to get home. I think it's number 44, he said, but I can't remember the street name. It was freezing cold out there. I was about to turn around, but the old man stood lost, and his eyes had that look that is unforgettable, that pulls. I don't know where I am, he said. Don't worry. Everyone forgets, I said. I will help you find your way home. Let's look at the numbers on the mailboxes to see if we can find 44 on one of these streets. But the numbers were small. Four, five, six. We kept turning around in a cold. Don't worry, I said. I will help you find the way home. I am here visiting my daughter, he said. She is a doctor. Do you have her phone number, I asked. We called her and found the address. It was a pleasant walk once we knew where we were going. We talked about his countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and mine, Romania, and how parents dream big for their children after wars end, where after families get away. His eyes were warm and calm, but he kept forgetting names and dates the way one slips on an oily kitchen floor. And I kept saying, fine, as if everything made sense. But then again, everything makes sense. He's an old father in a new country visiting his daughter. Memory is fragile, like a porcelain cup in a child's hands, elusive, like the foam of the sea when you catch it in your palm. It runs away from you, like a gap in breathing, when you are in the middle of a street you've never seen before, it tricks you into believing strangers are your family. You are my sister, he said. Thank you for bringing me home. I never know how streets are named, but I wonder about the precision of archery, the target and the aim of mind, eye, arm, the hands that hold the bow and arrow the trajectory of memory. I wonder if and how the gap in remembering his younger daughter's name, her husband's exact specialty in medicine, whether home now is Afghanistan, abandoned during the war, or Pakistan, where his girls went to university, and this freezing street where we met, have something to do with how we lose thoughts and bits of ourselves along the way, and find company and gratitude, even when the road behind us disappears, leaving us waiting, confused, away from home. Thank you. That's Thank you. How are we doing for time? Um, I think we could maybe do, we'll do one more question, then we'll open to the audience. OK. Uh, translation. <laughs> uh, it was what was a, something I thought of asking you about, um, because in, in your uh, uh, the book on, on the language of oppression, you actually range very widely over different languages. There, uh, how does one, uh, I suppose, what kind of faith does one have in the translator when you're dealing with? people who are writing in different languages. Yeah, I mean, um, and this I, I just wanted to make a compliment to you here as a translator of Romanian poetry. Um, I think the translator is an enabler of crossing. Mm -hmm. If you if you want to cross the borders between one country and another and, and give people a richer perspective on how people are and what people feel and what people think about, from other languages and from other countries, we really depend on a figure of the translator. And um, that ability not only to bring in, to ferry the gifts from one language into the next, but to put themselves into that sens sensitivity space where um, things will get filtered for you. And then actually, it, is that okay if I turn the question on to you about your experience translating? Um. Well, again, of course, the, the, the first thing that you feel when you're translating 
is inadequacy because you so often have to make a choice, am I going to keep this or that? Um, it, is it, uh, if, if I use a word uh, that has a residence in Ireland, but perhaps not in any other English speaking country, uh, am I limiting the impact of what's, what's there? So uh, it, I find translation is both, uh, it's, it's extraordinarily liberating, but it's also very anxious because, because of the, this sense of responsibility. Um, and then I suppose the other thing is, I think translated poetry has a limited audience. Uh, there's uh, a, a feeling that uh, people go to, there are many people who go to poetry and what they're looking for is not to find out how people feel in Afghanistan, say, they're, or how a poet might ex express themselves uh, in Chinese, but uh, they're, to, to some extent they're looking for a reflection of their own preoccupations and their own society. So I think it's a difficult thing to do, uh, but uh, on the other hand, as you say, we are so dependent on the translator, and we always will be, we will never have, nobody will ever have enough languages to be able to get on without the translator. So it is, it is, uh, it gives you a, 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 also a feeling of importance, which is always nice. Yes, I mean, because you're the one really, literally, at the borders between the languages, mm -hmm. deciding what goes in and what doesn't go out. So there is a sense of empowerment with mm -hmm. that, as much as there's a sense of humility, as, you, as you're saying, and anxiety about what goes in and what goes out. And it's, it, always, it always struck me how translators are such good readers, such good, close readers. Um, many of the translators I met are great scholars as well. They're, they're people who really read critically, really read closely, and that comes together with a big heart. The, the, the love, right? The, I mean, here we're going back to Hindi too, you know, the pleasure, the love of language. You wouldn't write it if it wasn't for the joy of it. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't read it if it wasn't for the joy of it. And you wouldn't go through the trouble of, you know, being blamed by a lot of people that you didn't quite get the right meaning if you didn't love us so much, right? That, that, that wasn't that joy of language. Mm -hmm. so. It's, I've always been very appreciative of that process, but then of course, as a writer in a non-native language, I've sort of come between translation, self-translation, and somebody who is able to have enough fluency to express herself. And what I'm missing sometimes, even in conversations like this, I'm missing the nuance of the cultural impact or the, the ones of the expression that you know, I'm, not, I'm never sure speaking English that I might be hitting the wrong note in some way that I might be saying something that is not quite right that is I'm seeing it from a starker perspective or from a different perspective it's very very hard and I so I imagine as a translator you're right there fighting mm -hmm. with the two languages of course some some poetry is more translatable than other uh, poetry uh, and uh, I mean perhaps it's what, what you described is one of the reasons why your poetry is full of facts, things, I mean even slices of salami, uh, even uh, descriptions of your grandparents garden, the, the, the concreteness of uh, what you're describing makes it possible to uh, to, bypass, to bypass any sense that you're not writing uh, in a native idiom. It's true, and I've become a bit of translator in the poetry itself. So I've recently written a poem during the COVID pandemic about my mother um, having been found with uh, some uh, uh, abnormalities in the brain. Mm -hmm. And um, I went straight to the Romanian word mm -hmm. and I translated it into English. Um, so it was a question about the subcortical subcortical infarcts that she's mm -hmm. been suffering, and it was operculum. It was the, the, the part of the the, the head, the, mm -hmm. the brain that was affected. And then I, I looked at that in Romanian is apoperire, but then again, mm -hmm. to cover, to, cover to, yes. to shelter, mm -hmm. yeah. to all of this. So I thought I'm just going to go and explain it straight into the poem. So 
think maybe because I'm getting older and more insecure, as you say, about what I'm saying, I want to go back to retrieve and to bring into English what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Is Acropolis also a, a roof? It is, yes, yeah. Acoperish a, is a roof a, a for the yeah, house, yeah. yeah. Acoperida is a, it's covering, but mm. yes, it's, it's, yes, it's really fascinating. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, trying to move between languages within a book, it's a very dangerous thing to do, I think, but it, sometimes it can really spark something, uh, uh, something that people will respond to, I think, uh, because they, 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 you know, oh, I didn't know that before. Yes. That feeling that, that you also get can, can get in poetry. 